myself out. I am afraid of this. I'm terrified and paralyzed by. I am deathly afraid of. Welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast with your host, me, Ryan Perio. Hello and welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Perio. This week, my guest is comedian and musician Crux Crawford. Crux is a comedian here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and he recently was in a metal band as well. Uh, he is taking a little bit of a, I guess with the pandemic, they're kind of keeping things as separate and working on things individually. Crux is a father of one, about to be a father of two. At the time of this release, he may be a father of two at this point. In this episode, we talk about comedy, music, parenting, and then we get into, we were going to get into his fear of being dragged out by water, but during our conversation, I had a, more, I had a question about being someone, him and his wife both being recovering, recover, in recovery from alcoholism and you know, led a clean life for over a decade and, you know, talking about the fear of being a parent of a kid and when they end up becoming older and maybe dabbling in things that they dabbled in as kids and wondering if they'll have the same impulse control issues that they did. So we get into that fear. So let's get into the interview right now with Crux Crawford. All right. This week, we're at the residence of One Crux Crawford, who has agreed to do an episode of my podcast after recording his episode. This one will come out much later than his, where I think his is probably coming out like in a week, if less than that. He's way more, I guess, almost impulse, like it's almost impulse with him. He's got it already ready to go and basically is put it load, locked and loaded, ready to fire as far as I would say podcast-wise. Me, I tend to just stockpile like a... He's the grasshopper in A Bug's Life, and I am the ant that just stockpiles for everything and just has a, a, a payload, whereas he just is relaxed and, yeah, we're just going to do it this week and edit and send it out. Which is the... Your way is the smarter way to do it, because if I run out of people, then I'm screwed and you're not. That's another reason I kind of chose like this genre is because I was like, well... I can interview anybody. I don't have to just be like, because I was afraid if I did a comedy podcast, one, I'm competing with a Joe Rogan, a Tony Hinchcliffe, all this other stuff. Sure. Yeah, 100%. Okay. I was like, there was a little bit of a cross thing there. Maybe it's my cell phone. Oh, okay. I'm like, okay. It's, there's a little bit of a little noise there, but nothing major. Okay. Cool. It went away? Yes. All right, good, good. Well, yeah, man, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for coming out and uh, doing my podcast. But yeah, I'm really uh, honored and thrilled that I get to do yours, man. I've listened to several episodes, so it's cool to be a part of it. It's awesome. There are several to choose from. Like I have, <laughs> I have, I'm proud of myself for making sure rain, sleet. The only, I think, hiccup I had was I was in Tulsa and I released David Ellers and I think I either one uploaded it without the file. And so I had an, an episode, but nothing, no podcast. Oh, man. And that was episode 49, and I was like, oh. And David's was really cool. His was eating in the dark, which was a very interesting fear. Like, he has to have light. Like, he has to shine a light on his food. Oh, okay. okay. Because he's like he had a situation where he had bugs, where he had, like, an Easter basket or something. He fell asleep, and he was covered in ants. Mm. And so now he has to inspect his food before he eats it. And so I was like, we're going to talk about that. No. <laughs> That makes sense, man. That makes sense. I mean, not to, obviously that was his episode. I don't want to dive into that and hijack the whole conversation with that, but I'll tell you like, that makes sense. Cause my wife was just telling me about like a, a little Caesars that someone posted, um, that they bought a pizza from there and that there was like a roach baked into like the, the crust and the cheese. And that's why they posted about it. Cause they're like, look at this, this is unacceptable. This is horrible. That's horrifying, man. You know what I mean? So think about if you were just eating that in the dark, watching a movie or something in your living room and then you ate it, you didn't even know. Uh, I feel, I feel for that. I relate to that. I feel for anybody that has to eat little Caesar's pizza. That's, <laughs> that is my own, I would say, I, I guess more a refined palate than, 
Yeah, um, no, that's true, man. Hey, man, I always talk about I talk about Little Caesars, man. They say it's it's hot and ready. They don't necessarily say it's good. Yeah, they just say it's ready to go. <laughs> so you are a newer comic here in the Dallas Fort Worth scene. You came from L.A. Yep. And so you started you about six months ago. We'll say or yep, give you, or take. You basically, or we'll say you, you this this is your true start. You've had instances where you started before. And yeah, it just fizzled out but now doesn't count you've recommitted yourself so yeah. this is your recommission date this is yeah this is where it really is like going out multiple times a week doing things succeeding failing but regardless of whatever the result is keep coming back the next day mm-hmm. so what is your favorite open mic so far favorite open mic i would have to say overall it's a close tie but um hyenas fort worth thursday because you get um like the red room is awesome. First of all, just like awesome environment to be in, especially at my level. Um, you got the wireless mic, you know what I mean? So you feel like you got a little bit of freedom. And then on top of that, you got a good chance at working in front of some kind of crowd, you know what I mean? To throw your ideas and get some honest feedback from people. Um, and then, uh, backdoor is awesome as well. So backdoor to me, would be the best open mic. And that's just because your audience is paying $7 to, or whatever it's half price. So it, it's half price on the weekend as a weekend comic there. I cannot attend their open mic because there are rules that are laxed on the weekends that if I were to go in there, she would have to then explain, you know, it, it makes a situation for her that, that she doesn't want to be in. So she just avoids it by just saying, you know, Hey, can you do other, but it's by far my favorite because again, it would be, it's, even though it's three to five minutes, depending on mostly three, I, again, I would get five. And so then that becomes a point of, well, why does he get five? And so we just avoid. And so she, right. that, that helps her, that helps her, <laughs> that helps her keep the rules. So it's, they should not have to explain why she's bending for others. Cause when I started, Paul would do it. Mark, all the big name comics, like the working, like Paul over was on comedy central and then he was doing her open mic. And it's like, and she would be like, well, he's doing five to seven and we're doing three. There will be people that are like, hey, you know, why does he get to do? And so she eventually just asked us to stop coming on week, the Thursday she's open mic. And so we did. And so once you, I guess, graduate to, a, I guess, a regular weekend performer, you will then be asked to, you know, not to attend open mics. And that's what I've heard. I've heard that from a couple couple of the weekend people that, that that's the dilemma because it is great. But at the same time, you know, yeah. you're going to be in a different slot and there's certain day. There's the Thursday, like Thursday right now. Has it always been Thursday or has that yeah, changed over It's time? always been Thursday. Okay. That so, is where I did my first ever stand-up set. Was no the, way. Yeah. In Backdoor. It, yeah, in 2006. I went there and met the person that we talked about in your podcast. He was also starting that day and we kind of started on the exact same day. Wow. No way. That's cool, man. That's cool. So I didn't realize that spot had been there that long. Oh, yeah. They've been there since Paul, I think, even may have started there. And that was like in 2000. He started kind of in the Addison and probably did Dean's class. And then, but he, he worked with Linda in the early 2000s and stuff. That club has been off and, off and on, like in different locations for at least 30 years or so. Like they've been various places over time. And okay. It, how long has it been at that spot? The Richardson spot. The Richardson spot, it's only been there since I would say 2018, maybe 2017, 2018, because we were at the Doubletree Hotel off 75 for almost 10 years. So I'll say 2018. And then that hotel, Top Golf's executives, I guess, Top Golf headquarters is in the building right across the uh, tollway slash right there, that little exit, that whole yeah. Northwest highway exit top golf's headquarters there. And they wanted to buy the room that we had back door in for a golf simulation. So like uh. they would, they would have people stay at that hotel and they could play a golf simulator by the bar. Oh, uh, okay. And so we had to then, I guess Linda and Jan had to then find a new location, which I, I enjoy this place. I think that it's a karaoke bar that has, they're kind of outcast, out karaoke outcasts and regulars. And so we had, they had backdoor house comedy outcasts and regulars. I was like, Oh, it's the same vibe. Like everybody there's, you know, it's kind of almost a cheers environment of everybody knows somebody. 
Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows your name. <laughs> but but yeah, man, uh that's true. I love that room. I think it's cool. I think it's great. Yeah, yeah I love being there. It's very so. it's very comedy seller ish kind of like it's you know, not it was you know, you the comedy seller probably wasn't designed to be a comedy club when it was designed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now it's become you know that it's odd it's weird it's odd shaped tables are everywhere but you get a great show yeah yeah for sure and the the fact that there's always the crowd there and stuff i mean it's really it's really cool and people are excited about it and and yeah and then like you know like with with highness fort worth i just love the layout of that of the club in general i think it's just it's just awesome like there's tons of places to sit and hang whether you're a comic or whether you're a customer uh, audience member and like the bar, like the, the, the different bars that are the way it's the layout, everything. I just love it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I worked the door there for a little bit just so I could get plugged in and meet some people and get acquainted with some people. And, uh, you know, and I've done like the open mics there. I just think it's, I don't know. I just really like the environment, okay. you know? So, but yeah, obviously backdoor is great. I mean, I've loved going there too. So, but, uh, but yeah, that's, those are definitely two really good ones for so sure. So I'll now ask you, what has been your biggest highlight so far in stand up? What has been like the what has been the crown jewel of your comedy career at this point? At this point, <laughs> um, I say so I was like I was really getting the itch to try to do some kind of competition. Um, but there aren't like I was told there used to be a couple here, like funniest comedian in Texas or something like that. And but just I guess right now, at least they're not doing them as much as they did pre covid. Yeah. Um, so. I was just kind of like, ah, I really want to do one um, that's like hosted by a club, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily just some guy that's putting it on, but like it's hosted by an actual club. So I flew up to in September, I flew up to Baltimore um, and I did uh, the one they have there monthly at uh, Magoobies. Okay. Um, and that was pretty cool because there ended up being the way that they do it is like you have to bring five people, you know, in order to be a part of it. And what I did, because I'm not from Baltimore is I literally just hopped on Craigslist and I was like, Hey, uh, in the free stuff section, I was like, Hey, I'm going to perform. If you want to come to a comedy show for free, I'll pay for your ticket and you can come watch a cool comedy show for free. You can stay for the whole thing. I just ask that you try to help me out. You know what I mean? If I get selected, et cetera. And I got five people, you know? So I was like, cool. So I, I just flew up there. I had some Southwest points on my Southwest card. So flew up there. I did the competition um, and so the way that worked is like the judges judge, like who makes it to the final four. And then the final, the final four contestants are, are based on audience applause. So, um, I made it to the final four. Um, after that, I was thrilled that I made it that far. I knew that I was done at that point though, because there were so many people, everybody's from Baltimore. I'm not from there. I just, I just, I'm from LA and I live in Dallas and I just flew up from Dallas. So there's no way that I'm going to win, which I didn't care about. I just wanted to do it because yeah. there was a hundred people. Um, when I stepped on stage, it was crazy cause I'm used to doing like, if there is an audience, like there's five, 10, 20 people. Same you know faces. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you step on stage with a hundred people. I mean, that gets real. You know what I mean? Like I'm a musician, so I've performed on stage a million times, but stand up is a different beast cause mm -hmm. there's nothing behind you. It's just you and your voice and that's it. So yeah, stepped on stage. I did, uh, my five minutes that I developed like at that, up to that point, um, had a good set, did really well. The first two people dropped out. So I got pushed to the, to the beginning. So the host did 10 to open it up. So I didn't have to like cold open it, mm -hmm. but host did 10. And then I came up and I had to be the first like c contestant comic to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I saw the audience real quick when I got on stage, but I got over, it. I snapped out of it. Like, you know, I, and I did my set, did good, you know, did well. The host was like, wow, that was good. Like, you know, and made it to the final four. So that was cool. That was an interesting experience because I got to perform in front of a, a that's the biggest crowd that I've performed in front of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being new, those are the kind of chances I'm going to get to perform yeah. in front of crowds that size, a competition or like, you know, like something like that. So that was fun. That was fun. Okay. Uh, yeah. And eyes and, and, and see empty seats is always a, a different animal. Like you see the, like you see people, it's like, Oh, hello. I'm not used to, you know, I'm used to being able on the stage and just ignoring this whole section because everybody's way back here. Yeah. And there you are right there. You're, you know, it kind of throws you over a little bit cause you have, you feel like, do I have to look down and acknowledge you? Do yeah. I? <laughs> so I totally get that feeling of, Oh wow. There's, there's people here. Yeah. And so you, you've been on stage before, so you're a musician. Yep. So what, what instrument did you? 
So I started, um, so for, for, you know, 10, 12 years, I started, first instrument I started playing was drums when I was like 11. Um, so I played drums for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, got obsessed with that like, uh, forever. And that's how I started playing in bands actually as a drummer. Um, and then I switched, I always did, uh, like choir and stuff like that in school. So I was always like a singer as well, but I never really did it in the band setting. But then, um, when I had like a couple different bands that didn't work out, like as the drummer, I feel like I'd, I'd have like a little bit more of a voice, like with the way that the music was sounding and like the way that the direction of the bands would go if I stepped up and like took like the vocalist position. So then, um, I like transitioned into that. So that's the hat that I wear now and have worn for like several years as far as band goes is being the vocalist. Okay. So yeah, the, my previous metal, I guess, band was the convalescence. Like she was the keyboardist from convalescence. Oh, okay. so I, I saw cool. the keyboard back here. I was like, Oh, if he's a keyboardist, I was like, well, yeah, no, no, I'm not that, I'm not uh that level of talent, man. I admire people who are piano players, keyboard players. That's, that's amazing. It's, it's complex. Like I can just do basic stuff on the piano and the keyboard, but nothing, nothing super, like I can't do compositions. I can't sit there and, you know, write these like elaborate songs on a keyboard or anything like that, you know? So here's how she said when she was talking about music is everybody during the pandemic, everybody would bring their piece to the table. Mm. So somebody would have like a bass riff, a, a you know, this rhythm guitar riff, the, the drums, and they would, you know, they would start trying to work it all together because you couldn't practice together. And I didn't, yeah. you couldn't have like a real jam session where like and you would just have to kind of, I guess, sample out your, your, what you've got going on. Right. And see right. what we could, you know, see what, oh, let me see what I have here to, and so how do you, how does your band, I guess, do that process? Yeah. No. And that's actually really, really, uh, good thing you brought up. Cause I feel like for a lot of, a lot of musicians, like everybody's been affected by the last couple of years of the pandemic and all that stuff, of course, but musicians, especially if you're part of a group or you're part of a band, um, you got to collaborate with people. So what we used to do, you know, when me and, uh, uh, Andre, the guy that I, that's my, my partner in, uh, in my group now that I've had for the past four years, we are the flesh. Like we used to obviously meet in person at each other's, uh, you know, condos and apartments and, and, um, uh, write music and work out our stuff and record our songs. Um, but then obviously when COVID hit, uh, a lot changed. So we had to start sending files back and forth to each other more than we ever had. Uh, and now, um, I'm, I live in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area. And then he moved out of LA as well around the same time I did and lives in Arizona now a little bit before I did, but we're in two completely different cities, um, outside of LA that are very far from each other. So what we do a lot now um, every now and then I'll fly out there and we'll collaborate in person. But the majority of what we do is we send just little pieces. I'll record stuff here at home and I'll send it over to him and then he'll do the same thing and we'll piece it all together. We'll just drop box the files mm -hmm. to each other and then just kind of do a kind of a long distance, uh, collaboration, you know, and then piece it together, piece it together and it eventually becomes a song. Yeah. And it's, it's gotta be fun to kind of audio almost like it's gotta be kind of fun because it's also yes, it's a collaborative event, but you get to have your own time with it versus a studio where, Hey, Hey, what about this? Like, you know, there's the, yep. you get the group excitement of what about this? And so you get to almost, you get to hear what they're, and then you also get to have a vision without other people, I guess, interrupting that vision. And so you get to almost, you may get better songs out of it almost just because you're able to completely focus on what's going on without, a distraction from a drummer. Like, what about this one? You know, like then you have to listen to that. And you know, you can kind of actually put all your time and energy into your part of this in conjunction with what they've got going on. And then they, you know, in turn also, it's almost like when kiss released their four solo albums and everybody, you know, got to focus solely on their vision of what they thought music should mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and you're absolutely right because th there are ups and downs to to either scenario, like with songwriting. Because so the upside to doing it remotely and just sending files back and forth and then combining the ideas, uh, just like you said, is that you get a chance to really just explore on your own, not have any interruptions, not have everyone's not have anyone's input until what you've done is already down 100. percent The downside to that is that when you're if there's something that you're having a hard time that the other person is having a hard time understanding, 
that when you're in person, you can just communicate that a lot more. Because if I'm right in front of you and I'm like, no, man, like, okay, so it's like this. You know what I mean? Then you're like, oh, it's like that. That's harder to do when you're just sending stuff yeah. back and forth, you know? So if they don't understand your vision, then it's hard to explain your vision. Yeah. It's a little bit harder. You can still do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it definitely, I like I don't like or dislike either way any more or less. I think that they're both beneficial and I think they're both productive. Yeah. I mean, if it, we you do go back to an in-person collaboration, I also think there's a quality of let's do a take home of everybody just take this home and you come back with your idea versus, you know, just hashing it out in the studio that night and staying up the three. Hey, let's just take it home and everybody just do, you know, the dedicated work, you know, on your own with, you know, no, you know, no one overseeing it. You know, everybody just... And then we'll just, you know, go from there and see what comes of it. And just, you know, instead of trying to make it work, let's just see what we have. Because, I mean, you may you may come up with three different songs. You may have something like, oh, you know, that melody is really doesn't fit what I what we want to do here. But, you know, I really like that for something. Another song that we could be writing, you know, here in a second. It's almost like you find you could maybe discover another song with the scraps. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's totally true. I mean, you can. That's happened numerous times with us where we're totally like, hey, what was this thing? I'll just I'll just send you this stuff I was working on. It's, if you hate it, it's whatever. I don't care. I'm not attached to it. And then the other person hears it and they're like, oh, oh man, this is how about this? This is great. It's like that. You want to work with that? I guess that's fine. And then it ends up being turning into something yeah. crazy. You know what I mean? So was your wife a groupie? Was your wife like a band groupie? Uh, no, that's that so funny. You, like you saw her in the crowd, like you. <laughs> yeah, no, man. Uh, honestly, so like the way I met my wife is, uh, so I've been I've been clean and sober off drugs and alcohol since 2004, a very long time. Congratulations. You know? Yeah, yeah, thanks, man. I used to I used to do heroin and all that stuff and be addicted and all that, all that stuff. Like homeless, you know, super young on the streets. It was by choice. It was by how I was living my life. It's not like you know, like, but you know, um, I brought it on myself. Yeah. But then you know, I I got sober. And, um, my wife, after I'd been in AA for a few years, I met her. She was also, uh, multiple years sober by then. So then we, you know, just met that way. So no, not a groupie, not a groupie. One of my uh, closest friends, like he was, he was addicted to drugs. His, his father kind of was addicted to drugs and it, you know, I guess even though his dad died at a young age, you know, when he was a very, or I guess my friend was young, his dad died from drug overdose and stuff. It just, it just slowly evolved into his life and that he kind of got it and he met his uh wife and that and like the addiction like he had to move away he had to go one of those ones it's like out of town out of out of all temptations reach and he met that girl there and they i guess kind of hit rock bottom together you know work together to build each other up and then they you know grew together had a fan now they have a family with three to four kids and you know it changed his life and you know there's all you know some people can you know can survive with with alcohol and, and and that kind of stuff in their life other people you know it's just it's not it's not meant to be and so you can it's really rewarding when you find somebody that's also in that same path so you don't have that in-house temptation of somebody that maybe you will know, you'd be you know have a cocktail or a glass of wine and it's also somebody that you know you know will hold you accountable as well yeah yeah, and I mean, those kind of stories that you hear, I mean, that's great that that worked out for them because that can go one of two ways. You know, you it can go well and last long, long term or when when people are, you know, like drinking and using drugs all the time, like with, on the addict level, the people that like need to not put like the people that have like me that have no business putting substances in their body because like I am not a quote unquote normal person in the sense that like I'm I'm not going to be able to stop if I do it, which is why I don't. Yeah. I, I don't even I don't have a thing against people that that do do drugs or alcohol. Yeah. I mean, I got good friends of mine that do. Yeah. I don't care. It's, a, it's an impulse control thing. Yeah, exactly. And I don't have that thing where I can just stop. Most people do. Yeah. You know what like, I mean? I'm, I need to stop now. Yeah. And so. You get so crazy when you're in the midst of all that stuff that when you get sober and you go to rehabs, you get treatment or whatever, and you start being in a clear state of mind, you can meet, you're so emotionally all over the place when you're new, when you meet somebody 
even though you guys click really well in the beginning, you might grow apart really fast because mm-hmm. you're so insane. So after that yeah. first year of sobriety, you might, but then again, some people can stay together. Yeah. So, and if it does, that's cool. Yeah. It works it, out. Again, that probably is an impulse control that it's an impulsive decision of, oh my God, this person likes me. Oh my God. Yes. We, ha- we have yeah. to keep this. I have to keep this good vibe in my life because I, everything else is, is so shit right now. She's, a, you know, you're the beacon that is going to, you know, help me. And, yeah. And sometimes it's just, you're, again, you're a human being at some point things just grow apart and you have to be okay with that. And, you know, it can also, you know, I guess inspire old habits and stuff to, Oh, you know, I, I deserve, you know, I deserved happiness and now it's, I'm not going to get it. So why, why try? And so you, you kind of, it's an easy way to fall back in sometimes to negative, I guess, traits, but you know, sometimes you find that person again, you, you work together and you're just like, okay, you know, you know what I've, you, she knows what you've been through, you know what she's been through. And it's kind of a thing of, you know, we know not to, you know, not to introduce these kinds of su- subjects or topics or anything in there. And, you know, we're better for it. We've got, you know, two kids that are healthy and or one and three quarters. Yeah. 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 Totally. Or one and nine tenths. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how, how close the fraction is. Yeah. Yeah. One and coming soon. So we're talking about January. So yeah, nine tenths is pretty close, but yeah. Yeah. Um, that's how that's how we met and stuff. But yeah, I, I feel like anybody who's like been in a long term relationship because me me and my wife have been together. We've been married since 2016. We've been together since 2012. I feel like anybody who's in who's ever been in any kind of long term relationship, even if you're you're not anymore, I feel like anybody who has been a part of something that's been like multiple years, I feel like everybody will agree with me when I say that it's not necessarily like how well you got along in the beginning or like when you like fell in love or when you started having like great like a lot of feelings for each other it's more about like how did you what happened when things got bad what happened when like a breakup period happened because like if you ever go to like relationship counseling or marriage counseling because we've been through uh, counseling relationship counseling before we were married um when we were having like a rocky period at like year three you learn through like books and like if you talk to a professional they'll always tell you it doesn't matter who you are like how much of the quote unquote dream couple you were how much you were quote unquote meant to be together every relationship is going to have what they call a breakup period and in that period someone can choose they can choose to split up or they can choose to work through the differences yeah so like the people that didn't work out they just it's not even bad good or bad it's just yep. they decided you know what we're different it's not worth working out we're going to split up then the other people go, Hey man, let's try to work through this. And it literally just comes down to that. It's like, did you want to try to work out through that breakup period or did you not want to? We almost didn't, but we decided to just can try to work through it. And we ended up successfully working through it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you just, it's again, realizing they're another person, like some comedian, you know, I'll, I'm friends with a lot of comedians and sometimes they'll be in a relationship. And I'm like, you know, they're, they're a human being. You, you can be upset at their choices and stuff, but at the end of the day, you, you can't, you can only, you can only present yourself in the best possible light. And they then have the, you know, it's up to them whether they would want to even go forward with this or if they just want, you know, to, to move on to something else. And if that's something they, you just, you, you appreciate the time that you spent instead of, you know, it's not time wasted, it's time spent. Like, it wasted would mean that you just, you decided to pursue stand-up every night and, you know, hey, what, you want to help me with the kids? No, sorry, stand-up. You know, I'm, I'm writing comedy. I can't help you. That's, that's basically, you know, wasted. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you, it's, it's, you learn you learn from the other person. You really learn how to like, uh, accept, you know, you learn about how to, uh, embrace people for like who they are and how to work around. Like you accept and kind of like productively work around that someone is, is different than you. You know what I mean? Like for her, for example, and I could talk about this on a whole extra level because we're both crazy alcoholics. So like we just happen to be sober, you know what I mean? So the way that I deal with things, like me, my, my, we call it like in the program, we call it character defects. Like, so, which basically means like, what, what kind of personality do I have that, mm-hmm. that are, that is like, where do I go to when I'm being negative? How do I lash out at people when I feel like I'm being treated unfairly? So me, my personal, what you call character defects, the way that I deal with things, when I feel like I'm being excluded, when I feel like I'm being persecuted, when I feel like someone is disrespecting me, my thing is 
I feel like I've been treated like shit. I'm going to treat everyone like shit. Let me lash out at everybody. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me show the world how cool I am and how stupid they are for trying to fuck me over. She's the opposite. She's like, well, what's wrong with me? I need to Mm -hmm. self harm. I need to introvert. I need to not talk to anybody. I need to shut the blinds and stay in this room by myself because something's wrong with me. Yeah. We're totally opposite. You blame everyone but yourself. She blames only herself. Yes. hundred percent. hundred percent. And like, we've both done a lot of work over time, obviously. So I can recognize that stuff like being sober for so long when I was younger, when I was newer, that would be me lashing out at everybody that rarely have still happens every now and then I'm not perfect. Never will be, but it happens a lot less now. Like, because I've had the experience of being like, ah, there's that voice. That's all that is. Turn it off. Don't listen to it. You know what I mean? I've gotten a lot better at that over time. So when your wife does blame you, is that like a victory? Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, of course. You mean like when she, if she like, if she tries, if she like gets mad at me or something or yeah, she just blames you instead of saying it's her. Like, yeah. Fucking yeah, that's that. Fucking you. <laughs> You're right, baby. There you go. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. I I I've really gotten really good at that. Not just with like like my wife, but also with my friends, like with yeah. people that I know, with people that I interact with. Like I've gotten way better than I used to be at just being like, "Hey man, not, I'm not taking anything personally." You know, it's, it's, uh, you're, you know what? You are right. Like, this is something I did wrong here that I could work on, you know, instead of just being like, no, man, I don't, I don't do anything wrong ever. It's yeah. your problem. Fuck you. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's just, I think it's getting older and like, in parenthood also like realizing, oh, I don't want my child to, you know, sometimes you just, you, you realize traits in yourself. You don't want your child to osmosis because they see it at home. And so you, you all of a sudden now have almost like, like I was talking with Lawrence when he had his kids, like you, just, it's like you almost have to now. You're like you have to be on good behavior because someone else, there's someone else involved now. There's somebody outside that, you know, by innocence could totally mimic you, and that would be, you know, to you would be heartbreaking. You know, it's like, oh no, that's not what I want my child to be, and so you almost become you know, like you're forced into this role model, I guess, role that you had, you, you know in 2016 probably never crossed your mind that this would ever you know be your your you know sing you're in a relationship but you're you're yourself you all you, you had all your music you had your passion fuck everything else now all of a sudden oh i got a i got a kid i can't say fuck at all anymore because now he's starting to talk and that's not what the words we want people yeah. to hear yeah yeah you do get this overwhelming sense of like responsibility and it does change the way that you interact with people because now, like if someone else, if someone's acting a certain way, I'd be like, oh yeah, but that's, that's, you know, they, I can picture them as like a little kid now in a way that I never could before. You know yeah. what I mean? Be like, Hey man, this guy was that way too. Just like I was, yeah. you know what I mean? Stand up comedy is a great way to say, yeah, I need to be a better parent to my kids. Like <laughs> <laughs> it is basically a, a, a nonstop con- a conveyor belt of people that have, that have probably, you know could have used better parenting at home. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Do you think so your opinion let me ask you this cuz you've been, you know, you you've been doing stand up comedy for a good long while like do you think that whole thing is true like everybody that's doing stand up is doing it for a reason because in one way or another like we're like uh kind of like misfits or like we had like some something weird or something different happened in childhood or some kind of some kind of trauma that we're working through constantly? I don't think it's trauma. I think it's just here are people that have been that for some reason or another feel like they have been silenced their whole life, whether it be by bullying from external bullies at school to dysfunctional parenting that's told them to shut up or, you know, just and, you know, any myriad of social you know anxiety of stuff that just they have they have either put the muzzle on themselves or have been muzzled. Now you're getting the opportunity Instead of being the guy that's always shoved down or picked on, you get to be the cool person. And everybody's first year is them living out the fantasy of being the cool guy. Like everybody has this false bravado. Everybody has this unauthentic point of view of, yeah, everybody date. I date this girl once. We were banging. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's this false bravado of, yeah, I'm cool. And people can tell by looking at you no one's fucking you 
you know, <laughs> right, right, right. We're, you know, it's it's the same thing as when you're in high school and you're like, yeah, I'm dating this model. She didn't go to this school, but she goes to a couple yeah. of schools over. Man, she's from Canada. You guys don't know her. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like people people can quickly realize when you're you're lying. Yeah, and again, that's the one of the pitfalls of writing simple is because you can you can we can poke holes in your story, and so why are you wasting our time with this bullshit lie that? doesn't really happen but you're trying to make it out like oh yeah you know some people can can bullshit some people can but there's a suspension of disbelief of the way you look to an audience person versus how you perceive yourself and that's where you will get these jokes that you throw out and you get no response it's because it doesn't fit what you look like like i'll give you an example of somebody we both know colby traber Mm mm-hmm Colby can't go up. Colby can't go up there with his persona. Talk about how how he's he constantly has women hitting yeah, him yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and it's not not to say that he couldn't, right? But he he can't he can't hold that that poker face, and the audience won't believe him because he's so soft spoken and so and so you know I guess genuine and and had nervous. He hasn't figured out what he wants to talk about, but. There is an innocence in in him that you can tell. Like, there's no way that he he couldn't he couldn't talk about being chauvinist or anything because no one would believe it. Right, right. That's the kind of that's that that's the kind of thing of okay, you need to figure out and just accept your flaws, accept some of the flaws that you have in your life. Like, you can accept the fact that you you know you don't drink and talk about that. Todd Birdwell also in the same boat you're in. And oh, I didn't know that. In cool. a band, recover, you know, doesn't drink. You know, his bassist got used to get trashed and everything else. Okay, and so he talks about you know being sober, inviting pe- people, inviting him to tailgate. So, yeah, you know that <laughs> it's a great bit, but it's you know talk about being sober. Like you know, I'm what am I going to do at this tailgate? Where all you do is drink. Okay, well, what am what, what what am I going to do? Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that about him. That's cool. That's cool. Um. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because obviously I'm very new to stand up comedy, but there's so many parallels. Like I was talking about this with like uh, Alonzo Bowden when he did my podcast. Like he's been doing. Not only has he been sober since 1989, he's been sober a long ass time before he actually started doing stand up. But he's also been doing stand up since like '92, and he's been doing stand up a long time. So I was talking to him like, isn't it so funny how there are a lot of like similarities between people that um that are like when you see people that are new in like AA or new in sobriety compared to like people that are new in stand up. Like cause there's a lot of commonalities in terms of like being an open micer, for example, when you're new in AA, you go to like the same, generally speaking, you're going to go to a lot of the same meetings throughout the week, every week. And you see people here on Mondays and you see this group of people here on Wednesdays and you see this group of people here on Fridays, you know, and you see like, Hey Tom, like, Hey Bridget, like you'd see these people. It's kind of like the same thing. You go to these yeah. common places and you guys all see each other. And there's some people that are new and there's some people that have been doing it a while. You know what I mean? And there's some people that everybody knows cause they've been around. There's some guy that no one knows. It's very similar. And then since also where like, since I've been in AA so long, I've been sober so long. When I can hear somebody share, like at a meeting, I can tell based on what they say and how they conduct themselves, like how new or how long they've been around. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And the drastic difference between like having less than 30 days of sobriety uh, between having uh, a year mm-hmm. is very different. Very different. Because you go through so much in that first year. And then compared to five years, then like five years is like when you start to really get some real solid sense of like what you're doing and real solid sense of sobriety. So there's, there's a lot of parallel to comedy in that sense too, in that it's not an overnight thing, man. This, this is, this is a process that's going to, that takes years for you to develop and really get some maturity in, you know? So it's interesting that there's a lot of parallels like that. It's easy now, but come back in five years when, you know, you've, you've had to, you know, you've had temptations that, you know, and you have, and you've been able to just withstand and be like, yeah, no, not for me. Rather, is where you're, where you're, you may hang out with your friends that are all, you know, should be an AA, but not. And, right. you know, they're offering you drinks or, you know. And, have you done the work to be prepared for that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That comes out, you know, that comes out for sure. And, uh, has life, life happens to you, you know, life had just, life happens to everybody that's not dead. So mm-hmm. like, uh, you, you move, you know, you change jobs, you get let down, you don't get that promotion you thought you're going to get. She breaks up with you. Uh, you know, um, your friend screws you over. 
that you did, never thought would screw you over. You know, things happen to you that are going to be out of your control that you don't expect to happen. And how do you deal with those? Do you respond in a sane way? You yeah. know what I mean? Do you respond in the way that you're supposed to in the sense like, are you doing the work that you're supposed to be doing to respond to it accordingly? You know what I mean? And those things, it's not necessarily that people who like make it there are the winners and people who don't are the losers. It's not about that, but it's just saying where you're going to be right now at 30 days is going to, is unexplainable how day and night that's going to be from five years from now. You know what I mean? If you stick with it, you know? So, and like in terms of comedy, I consider myself on like comedy probation because I'm like barely, I'm like so, so new. I'm barely six months in the game. So it's like, let's see how long I'll last. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I need to, I need to keep doing this thing and like prove to myself, like I'm not just here to do this just this week or this month. Yep. So I kind of want to change fears than what we've talked about. Cause sorry. I, yeah. We've gone on too long. I've got an interesting one that's developing. How are you as a parent of a one-year-old? How are you going to how are you going to handle your kids possibly drinking? Like how do you how do you handle that situation? Because they're never going to see you with a drink in your hand, mm -hmm. and but you're going to have to probably go get your kids from a, a party or something. And how do you? I guess how do you navigate those waters as a parent? You know, or how are you how are you mentally preparing yourself for that part of the? sobriety is that what if my son doesn't have the, has the same lack of impulse control that I do? Sure. No, it's, it's a real fear. It's a real, it's a reality and it's a real possibility. Um, cause he's got it from both sides of the gene mm -hmm. pool, you know? So, um, I just have to, what I would do like is, and I've thought about this briefly before. Um, I just have to, um, uh, just be honest, you know, mm -hmm. I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd come from a place of understanding, first of all. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like, I, cause I don't forget where I came from, you know? So, uh, I can't forget where I came from, you know what I mean? Cause otherwise I'll drink, you know, or otherwise I'll start doing drugs again. So I'll come from a place, I'll, I'll I'm going to come from a place of care. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I would not be that parent that just like buys like a 12 pack for like a bunch of 15 year olds or yeah. like, you know, let's. Uh, they're like teenager do drugs in the house or something. Cause I growing up, like when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, I was, I not only had parents, uh, a parent that allowed that, but I also was over at friends houses who had parents that would allow that. And at the time you think, Whoa, these, these are cool parents. Yeah. But now as an adult and as a parent myself, I would never fucking yeah. do that. Never. Like I would never encourage it. Now your example to answer your question, if I have to go get my son from a party cause he's been drinking or if I, if he comes home and stumbles in one night and I realize like he's fucked up. Yeah. I, once again, I would come from a place of understanding as much as I yeah. could yeah. come from a place of understanding. Yeah, because you know? I, I, it's one of those things, too, where you have to also prepare him, kind of almost, you know, shape him like, hey, you know, your, your family, because my grandfather was a big time alcoholic. OK, so that it, it, it kind of hits home for me because my grandfather was the hide the whiskey bottle behind the bookcase. Like we would find these, you know, bottles everywhere after he passed out. And, you know, it's in your, in, even that far removed from my family, it's still there. And so there is a, in alcohol is a very easy drug to, or, or chemical, we, we, I won't, drug, chemical, whatever you want to call it, where you can, as you build a tolerance, like, oh, it's only this much. It's easy to rationalize to yourself, I've drank this much before, I'm not any different. And you just, as you build the tolerance, but you just keep you just basically you you come almost i guess explain to yourself like yeah um, one more how much one more can one more affect me I, I think i can you just test the waters and and, and you, like you said if you have if you know th that lack of impulse control if it's passed on to him how do you help him recognize hey you're when you do this you don't know you know, how do you, how do you explain you're never going to know when to stop? Because as a teenager, people are like, you don't know me, you know, and you've been in their shoes. It's, it's just, uh, to me, as, as you're explaining all this, you know, your life, I'm like thinking to myself, man, that would be terrifying to have your, you know, ch you know, to, to wonder if your child's going to have the same vices or the same impulse control issues where once he once he goes into it like he just keeps 
and I would, I just, I, I would worry even my own child, but I mean, it's got to be with a one year old and another on the way, like they're both yeah. going to be similar age. So in one way they'll, they'll have their own little support group of each other. But once, if one of them starts going the negative, does the other person hold it in? Does he not tell us the, or is this she, I don't know if you're new. One. Oh, it's going to be another boy. Yeah. Okay, it's going to be two boys. boys. So yeah, like does, does one rat the other out? Does one, do they keep it all hidden or? Yeah. And that's going to go down how it's going to go down. But as a parent, I know as scary as it is to try to like convince as much as I could, like my impulse is probably going to be to convince them not to keep drinking or to do drugs or whatever mm-hmm. they end up doing. I also know that the, the worst thing I can do mm-hmm. is try to come down and I'm like, don't do this stuff. Yeah. You can't do that because that, then they're going to want to do it more. Yeah, that's or, just how people are. Or they just you you know they just shut down when they talk to you at all points, and so you're just talking to a wall. Yeah, or like they're getting interrogated or whatever. You know what I mean? Feel like I'm talking to a cop. Yeah. You know? Or they just they just leave. They just you know they get they get their friends to come pick them up or whatever, and it's just a you know one yeah. of those, that's that that that's to me the more terrifying is that they you know they can at some point they can make the decision to walk, and it's like you know I don't. <laughs> You can't do anything. You're almost you're you're, you pa- you're you're a powerless bystander watching your cow- child say, you know, "Screw you!" You know, yeah, a hundred percent. And that's the scary reality. Is like the best thing that I could do is just try to come from a place of understanding. Because at the end of the day, man, and I can tell this from experience, like if you really are like not just a partier, but you cross that threshold into legitimately being an addict or an alcoholic, uh, no one can make you stop. You have to make you have to come to that realization that this is out of your control and yeah. you need something outside of yourself to change it. And everybody's time that they take when they realize that, luckily for me, yeah. I got really lucky, man. That happened when I was really young. It happened very early in life. Some people, it takes to, till they're in their 50s. It takes 30 years of just completely, just causing wreckage to finally realize, hey, you know what? I should probably, try, I, let me try something different, you know? And it's, it's a complete crapshoot to when that's gonna click in that person's brain. So that's the scary, whether I like it or not, that's mm-hmm. the scary reality of it. There's nothing I can do about that. Have you and and your wife talked about like that? Like what kind of like plan, kind of develop like a loose plan of action? Like, okay, you know, let's kind of go through the scenario that they come home drunk or. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about it briefly, but we both know, cause we've both been sober a long time. Mm-hmm. Like we both know that, and we both partied hard, very young. So like it's going to be very easy for us to tell yeah. what's going on. Cause we'll be able to be like, okay, like, I know what you're doing. You yeah. know what I mean? Like there was a period in time, like, I have a sister who is, is a normal person. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In high school, um, she's quite a few years younger than me. So in high school I was already multiple years sober by the time she was starting to do her little party phase in high school and stuff. And my mom was always concerned because of what she went through with me. And she was like, you know, um, what do you think? And all this stuff. And I was asking like, well, what is she doing? And what is the behaviors and stuff like that? And I immediately went like, okay, well, this is what she's doing. This is the amount of partying she's doing. I talked to her and I was like, look, I know this is what you're doing based on what m- mom said, how you're behaving. She's like, how did you know? How did you know I was sneaking out and doing that? I'm like, cause she described, cause I'm, I know what's going on, man. I was, that, <laughs> how was you? Yeah. Yeah. And then, but the difference is fortunately, the difference is between, between her and I is that she is is a normal person in the sense that she can party, she can choose to go to a party and drink, she can choose to like, you know, mm-hmm. get high with somebody or whatever. And then she can also choose to stop. Yeah. She can make those decisions and she can wake up the next day and go, I'm not going to do this today and just not do yeah. it, which is what most people can do. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's fine. Um, not so with me. That just doesn't yeah. work like that. You know what I mean? So uh, fortunately, my mom only has one kid that has yeah. that issue, you know? Have you thought about like showing some of your children, some of your party past at a certain age to kind of let them know that, hey, at one point, you know, I did do some, you know, some stuff. And, you know, I just want you to see that this, you know, this happened in my life so that I can, you know, share, you know, almost like share like, OK, here's some of the pitfalls and things that I worry, you know, as a parent that, you know, that I did that I wish I did differently or maybe to kind of, I guess, maybe give them a you know, here's the consequences possibly. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think it's all about if you explain it from uh, to answer your question, yes. But then I think that's a good way to do it because then you're not going, 
hey, like, listen to me. Don't do this. I'm telling you what to do. You need to listen to me now or else. It's more just like, this is going to be up to you, but yeah. I'm just letting you know there was this and there was this and there was this. Yeah. So building credibility. Almost. Yeah. Like I was cool once. Like I was, I'm not just your dad. Like yeah. I, was, I was a cool, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not focus too much on the bad parts, but I was cool. Like yeah. I was, I was, I was, I was cool. I'm a band. Like I did everything. Right, right, right. Which is cool. I mean, that's something also you, like you have music you can share with the kids and stuff. So that yeah. that's also really cool. Yeah. So they can make fun of it when they get older and be like, oh, this was not I mean, good. But I mean, it's also like you could just have a, you know, father son jam session where you just yeah. have, you can have, you know, three guitars or whatever you wanted to do. And, you know, they maybe they fall in love with music the same way you have. And, you 100%. know, 100%. Yeah. No, that that's definitely cool. I, I think that's a, that's a really big crapshoot and just how the chips fall and that, uh, when you have kids, because like every day you always think about like, I wonder what they're going to be like when they're like 12 or what they're going to be like when they're 16 or whatever. And you don't know some, it's just a complete matter of chance if they're going to be into something that you're into. Like if you're yeah. going to get along, you're going to have the same hobbies or if you're not going to, yeah. you know what I mean? So like they could be a person that is, they could develop into a person that's into something totally different that you don't relate to at all. And you got to kind of try yeah. to figure out how to relate to them there. So yeah, it's interesting because mm-hmm. like, so what is your wife like? Is she like art or is she a... Yeah, so she is a horse trainer, Okay. first of all. That's her career. She's taking a break from it right now because like she's having a baby, but um, she's like been riding competitively all her life with English uh, horseback riding and she can teach too. She teaches. Um, she'll eventually go back into that whenever she's ready, but that's her kind of like passion and that's her trade and also what she gets to make money at doing um, when she's working. So um, that's pretty awesome. I know nothing about it. Okay. I, I don't care a lot about it not in the sense like i respect what she does but mm-hmm. it's not my passion so you're I, not gonna get on a horse is that what you're i've to? been on a horse you know what i mean but like i'm gonna get on a horse just as much as she's she's not a musician yeah. she's not a comedian so it's just not her thing you, you know you may you may have one go one way one the other one may go to horses and the other may go to music like you may have yep. the very ability to split but also keep together because they, you know, each of them has a different interest, but it's something that both of you, one of you can share with the other. Yeah. Which as a kid to have, be around horses is probably going to be a thrill for both of them and any future, other future Crawfords you may yeah. end up with in the, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. It's really interesting to kind of see how it's yeah, like we were talking about. It's just like complete toss up for, um, for what they're going to be into. Yeah. hundred percent, man. You never know. Y'all, y'all try to slide something in there, like a little, like a, like maybe put a little p- guitar pillow up in there, uh, or something, like just maybe. We might, <laughs> who knows? Either of us might end up doing stuff like that, but it's just it's so early right yeah. now, man. We don't know. Yeah, like but, little pony books or something, like yeah. little pony toys or so just. <laughs> yeah, man. nothing, nothing yet, but I'm sure that stuff's coming down the pike for sure. That's got to be like as a new parent, that's got to be like it's you're just the a, a beta tester for toys. Yeah, totally. You never what do you know think of this? Yep. hundred percent. You never know what they're going to be into. And uh, most of the time it's like you spend money on a bunch of toys and then you just play with an empty cardboard box. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, that, that, that happens even as an adult. Like there's, there's so much you can like, Oh, I could do this with this or yeah. repurpose. And you know, as a, as a parent, like I feel like that's all you were, you're just like, Hey, so this is Nerf. Uh, they're kind of a big company. They're they're wanting you to demo their football. Uh, yeah. So what you think there, champ? Yeah. <laughs> just you and your wife look at each other like, okay, no for the nerf. That's gonna be a no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just never know. Because it's got to be hard. Like the first few Christmases. Yeah. No, wondering what they're like. What do you want? Right. Gonna take you, to. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And then you have to kind of placate your both your parents that bring them gifts that. Is absolute garbage and yeah yeah because they'll give you they'll give you like the toy that like I, when i bought toys like i have one of my friends had a baby and i got this i was like it was cheap little train on wheels and i picked it up and i as i walked to the checkout the train horn went off no less than 30 times and i'm like let's solve this problem and i just went home took the batteries out and like gave it to him no batteries and i was there like there's, it's like there was bad, there was a battery in here, but you probably won't ever want to 
and they play with it. I'm like, yeah, you're right. We, yeah. And they play with that train probably for like the first five years. Like it was like, it, it was ran into, until it broke it when they ran into the wall so many times. It's, but you just don't know. And it's like, sometimes it's just the cheapest thing. It looks. You yeah. Know. Yeah. No, that's totally true. And because, uh, and that's really cool that you did that because for, uh, for our son's first birthday, uh, my wife suggested to everybody that she invited, like, if you'd like to get a gift, she's like, first of all, you don't have to, but if you want to get a gift, cause a lot of people want to get a gift, um, please, here's a list of things because she wanted to pick things that weren't like annoying and noisy. So the fact that you actually had the foresight to do that is actually cool. Yeah. And I usually try to get clothes for the future. Like, okay, let's get six month clothes for three month birthday. You know, something, yeah. something that's, they don't have to use today cause they've got clothes for today. Yep. Clothes, clothes at six, four to six months is, is what they need now. Like I try to always look for the future. Like, okay, one year, let's get two to three year clothes so that, that has something at the back of the closet so that as things get pulled out because they're no longer fit because first year of childhood is pretty much you're buying, you should just have two outfits. Yep. Pretty much, man. Pretty much. And then they end up, you know, there's a period where they grow so fast. So yeah, like buying stuff for the future is way better because they're going to be there quickly yeah. at some point. Yep. And so a hundred percent. So that's interesting that like you've already, like, oh, cause I was thinking like they probably already have discussed a little bit. Like what if this happens? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I feel like that's what a lot of parents do when you put the kid to bed and before they go to sleep, it's like, okay, so what if, what if, you know, what if he does this? Yeah. No, hundred percent. Or like what, what if, uh, you know, what if they turn out to have, you know, like this kind of personality or that personality, you just, you just never know. And like what you're prepared to do. Cause that is something that I'm like, man, how am I going to relate to somebody that's just into something totally different? And you have to figure that out. But obviously I'll cross that bridge when I get yeah. there. You just, I, I would say just most valuable resource is time. And so I think even if you're not interested in what they're doing, the fact that you're spending time learning and letting them engage and stuff like that, that that's what they remember is, I would say a lot of people that are in, you know, bad parenting situation remember all the times they weren't, that there was no time or that they're, that they chose something else besides time with them. And so I think it's just basically spending time and just talking and just keeping that dialogue of being able to talk about anything without being like, what, what, yeah. you know, all of a sudden, you know, and just, just keep an open dialogue. Yeah. You know, growing up's weird, you know, and they're, you know, when they get to their teens and stuff and you, know, you got the long car ride somewhere, just having that open dialogue of, Hey, I know certain things are happening at school or, you know, anything you want to talk about, just, you know, I'm here to, I'm just here to absorb and not judge. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, to me, that just seems like the, that's how I would do it. It's like, it's just, I'm just, I'm, I want to give you time to, you know, vent and somebody you can talk to without feeling like you're in trouble or cause there are going to be times where I will, I will, you will be in trouble with me and you, right. will, you, there's going to be those times, but I also want you to understand that there's a reason you're in trouble and you can't, and it's not just because I don't want you to do that. There's more, there's an overarching thing than just that action. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, I'm trying to make you aware so that you don't, that you, you grow up and don't make, a lot of mistakes that maybe I made or, you know, some, you know, my parents made. Yeah. No, hundred percent. It's like, there are going to be times where it's like, it's like, look, there's gonna be times where you don't like me. You don't like what I'm doing. And that's fine. That's, that is what it is because that's like being a good parent, like yeah. in my opinion. But at the same time, I want you to feel like I'm also, you might hate me sometimes like, you know, hate in the sense that like, I didn't let you go somewhere you wanted to, or you didn't do something you're supposed to. So now you have consequences to face. But at the same time, I want to have a relationship with you to where if something is wrong or you do, you do have a problem, you come you, to me. You, you don't feel like shut off from me. You yeah. feel like you can come talk to me. I am here to help you. Like I do love you. It's just that, uh, I'm also your parent. I'm not yeah. your friend. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm here to teach you things. And sometimes those are going to be things you don't like. You know what I mean? But I also, I am here for you still. So don't, don't feel like you can't come to me with something, you know, it's like a fine line. I think you got to probably something you got to learn over time, you know? Yeah. So 
Well, I appreciate the conversation, Crooks. Uh, yeah, absolutely, man. Where can people find you on social media? Um, every social media is, uh, cause my name is so unique. So it's at Crux Crawford, you know, Instagram, uh, TikTok, Twitter, et cetera. And then my podcast is the Crux Yeah podcast. You can see link in the bio on all those profiles. So how did you come up with the name Crux? Like, is that really your name? Like, no, it's just performer name. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Was, it's like, okay, Chester. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's just a performer name. Um, I just liked it cause it's like the meaning the true meaning of the word is like the crux of the situation. So it's like what people are like talking about now. It's the real subject at hand. So it's like, kind of like, that's a cool thing. And then it just, it just kind of sounded cool. Okay. So, you know, just went with it. Is that what your kids are going to call you or besides dad is crux or no, nah, I mean, or, just, unc- or if you have sister, your I guess siblings have kids, uncle crux. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Like it'll, it'll probably be just like, uh, mainly it'll probably just be a performer name. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, <laughs> thanks again, crux. Thank you so much. So that was crux. That was a fun conversation. I really enjoyed our conversation. It was a little comedy heavy, mainly because we recorded his podcast beforehand, which is a comedy podcast where he kind of talks about his comedy journey. You can check that out at Crux Yeah on all podcasting platforms. There'll be links to that in the show notes. Also, you know, check out Crux Crawford. He's he's an up and coming comic. He'll be doing some local shows off one offs here and there throughout the city. Uh, thank you guys again for listening to this. It was a very fun conversation, a really interesting fear. It's something that, as someone that doesn't have kids, kind of just popped in my head during our conversation about being, you know, you know, sober, you know, all these years of sobriety. And how would that be different as a parent? Like when you are you have all these demons and stuff, how do you, how do you parent against that? Because that's got to be a huge fear as a parent to have someone – follow in those footsteps instead of you know the footsteps that are positive but you can check check him out uh, it's an awesome podcast awesome comedian he's going to be on the rise here in very short order also i will be recording my album as luck goes next weekend at fort worth hyenas which will be a fantastic show with rob little my good friend should be a fun weekend uh, the weekend after that, I'll be working with Kevin Farley in Dallas at the end of January. And then we'll see what February brings us. So hopefully I'll have some more dates by the next time I let, let out a podcast. I've sent out some avails. Hopefully we'll get some responses back. Thanks again for listening. If you like what you hear, leave a review. Um, if you have feedback, email me at somefearfans at gmail.com. Right now I'm in Oklahoma City where it's windy and cold and just little bits of dust of snow. And then I have two more shows tonight, one more uh, tomorrow for MLK Day, and then it'll be back to work Monday morning. I will drive home at night and then sleep in my own bed. So hope you guys have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Sum of All Fears podcast, and hopefully after next week I'll have details on album you know how the recordings went and hopefully we'll have an album to talk about in the near future thanks again for listening to the sum of all fears podcast have a great week and now some thank yous for the folks that make this show possible thanks to barry whitewater for my art and graphics you can follow him on instagram at b white h2o get it h2o like water you can also follow him on facebook music a huge thank you to Gunnar Olson for the wonderful music provided for this podcast. You can follow him on Instagram at gunbuns, that's G-U-N-B-U-N-S, as well as his website, GunnarOlson.net. Check out some of the samples that he has recorded. They're amazing. He's an amazing percussionist. If you want to follow the show, we've got a Facebook group, Some of All Fears. Instagram, Twitter, you can find us at Some Fear Fans. If you have some feedback for the show, email me at somefearfans, S-O-M-E-F-E-A-R-F-A-N-S at gmail.com. I'll be happy to, to take those into consideration. Also, if you'd like to be a guest, email me at somefearfans at gmail.com. We can try to iron out some details and get that settled in. You know, give us some feedback. If 
on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, leave a review. It makes the show bigger, and it's not going anywhere. I'm going to record as many in- shows as I possibly can. If you want to follow me on social media, I am at Ryan Perio. It's R-Y-A-N-P-E-R-R-I-O on all social media platforms. You can follow me there, and you can check me out at ryanperio.com, my website. I'll try to list upcoming shows there as well. It's been kind of spotty because as soon as I set it up, that's when the pandemic happened, and everything's kind of just in a in a holding pattern. Thanks again for listening to the Sum of All Fears podcast. Next week, we'll have another guest with another fear. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.